science would never be the same again. You cannot think of modern science without computers. You can also not think of modern science without the electron microscope, or certainly all the knowledge that has been collected with the electron microscope. The genius behind the discovery was Ernst Ruska, a young German electrical engineer based at Berlin's Technical College. His secretary, Lotte Lambert, worked closely with him to the end. Everybody liked to work with him and for him. He was very popular. He was regarded, everybody said he's the father of the electron microscope. His work was his life. He was what we would call today a workaholic. The dreadful irony was that as Germany was becoming the most murderous regime in history, Ruska had developed a machine that would uncover the secrets of life itself. The microscope had changed little in the years since it was discovered, but in the 20th century, it was no longer adequate. The power of an optical microscope is limited by the wavelengths of the light beams used to view a specimen. Since electrons have shorter wavelengths, they could magnify more. Ruska's genius was the discovery that a magnetic coil could act as a lens to focus an electron beam. Here on, on this PowerPoint presentation is a picture of the design of the first microscope that had more than one lens. And this design has as date uh, 9th of March 1931. And uh, here you see uh, these areas um, that are crossed through uh, here and here. Those are actual magnetic lenses. And his main invention, or one of the principal inventions, was to concentrate the magnetic field into a very narrow gap. And in that very narrow gap, one then has a very strong magnetic field and uh, thus very strong lenses. And uh, that is what made uh, the high magnifications possible that, uh, that he, uh, he first achieved. This is what Ruska's electron microscope has become today. A revolutionary and complex piece of engineering that can investigate the actual building blocks of life. The electron microscope was called uh, das Übermikroskop, and uh, the, the super microscope, the, the, uh, and it was a quantum jump. Suddenly you can look inside cells, you can see mitochondria, you can see uh, all kinds of little compartments in cells, and the whole organization of life within the cell was largely explored by the uh, advent of, of the electron microscope. The Nazis, though, took no interest in Ruska's extraordinary discovery. There was, after all, no clear way in which the electron microscope could be used to promote Nazi militarism or propaganda or its racial policies. It was left to Ruska and his mentor, Max Knoll, to look elsewhere for funding and support. They could see the commercial potential of their invention. In 1930s Germany, though, they struggled to find an entrepreneur willing to finance their work. They trudged from pillar to post, they gave lectures, they tried to convince people in industry and in big firms who would take the, the risk to do that. It was difficult to, to convince them. They didn't believe that it would, would be useful. In Nazi Germany, Ruska, a social liberal, waited six years before the industrial giant Siemens finally decided to fund his research. He worked in industry, uh, which is often seen as inner emigration. You weren't working at the university, um, teaching students, um, maybe having to inject ideology into your lectures. Uh, so the question is, would it have been better if he emigrated? And would science have been weakened even more if all these fine scientists had left? Despite the difficulties, Ruska stayed on in Germany to pursue his work on the electron microscope. Numerous Nobel Prize winners would owe their own discoveries to Ruska's invention. But it was not until 1986, just two years before his death, that Ruska himself gained the ultimate prize for his invention. This was the crown of his life, the Nobel Prize. He said it was a recognition for electron microscopy. He didn't think of him personally. He said, finally they recognized the whole field of electron microscopy, how important it was. He was happy for that. The electron microscope may have flourished despite rather than because of the Nazis. 
Yet in the new possibilities it opened up for research into viruses and other diseases, it paralleled one important aspect of Nazi ideology. They would call Adolf Hitler the great doctor of the German people. They talked about enemies of the state being like a cancer or the Jews being like a cancer. Uh, they talked about a bacillus uh, enemy uh, people. Uh, and so uh, you both, I think, at the metaphorical level, the, the, the policy level, but also at this level of just uh, increasing the, the health of the German citizen in order to increase the health of the, the German state, medicine and, and public health was, was wrapped uh, all of that together. This was all part of Hitler's propaganda war. But as the 1930s gave way to the 1940s, Hitler had to concentrate on the very real war he was fighting against the Allies. Hitler now needed to acquire new military hardware. To achieve that, German technological know-how would play a vital part. On September the 1st, 1939, the Nazi army smashed into Poland. The outbreak of war in 1939 radically changed the focus of German science and technology. The priority now was the development of new weapons that could give Germany the military edge. Wars tend to have a tremendous forcing function on technology. They tend to accelerate technology simply because a nation state has no higher obligation than to survive in war. What the war does is it, it shifts priorities in the direction of pragmatism, the pragmatism of short-term uh, military goals. Almost everybody that wanted to try to do something was able to get money from, from the German government. If it was, let's say, guised in the context of a wonder weapon or a super breakthrough technology or something that could turn the tide of the war. Famously, the V-1 and V-2 flying bombs eventually became the super weapon that Hitler thought might win him the war. But in the early 1940s, both the Allies and Germany sought air superiority. And the key to this was ever faster planes. Both sides were trying to develop a fighter plane powered by a jet engine. But German engineers got there first. The man behind the new fighting machine was Ernst Heinkel. Ernst Heinkel was an individual who was really obsessed with speed. It seems to have been the great unifying driver in his technical life. Piston-driven planes were already flying in excess of 450 miles per hour virtually at the limit of propeller-powered flight. But Heinkel was determined to go one better and become the first with the jet engine. And he put together a team uh, under what he called Special Project 2, which was uh, kind of highly proprietary, and we would call it a compartmented program. They built a special part of the factory where they, only certain people could go in. And he actually assigned a team of engineers and technicians to make this come together. The first successful flight of Heinkel's prototype jet-powered plane, the HE-178, took place over a forest in northern Germany in August 1939. Heinkel believed the speed allowed by the jet engine would be a critical weapon against which enemy planes would have no defense. The jet engine was basically seen as a propulsion device that could enable an airplane to fly at very high speeds at high altitude. By flying at high altitude, you have much greater aerodynamic efficiency. In other words, the plane flies further for a given amount of fuel. And the jet engine could simply accomplish this in ways that a propeller aircraft could not. The jet simply gobbling air, mixing it with fuel, igniting it. Uh, the jet engine uh, was clearly a design element here that could give you the potential of the 500 mile an hour airplane or even beyond. It would be a high speed engine for high speed airplanes. A week after Heinkel's prototype was successfully tested, Hitler sent German troops into Poland and war was declared. On the ground, 
the German army swept all before it. In the air, the Luftwaffe was no less ruthless. Germany had built its military force around the concept of blitzkrieg or lightning war. And Hitler was so concerned with using the airplane as a tool of bombardment, as basically a bomber, that he was slow to come to the jet engine. The jet's speed meant it could outfly any enemy plane, either as close support for bomber attacks or in aerial combat as a lethal weapon against Allied bombers. But Hitler's aggressive military instincts meant he always favored the bomber over the jet fighter. He would soon pay the price. By early 1940, the German advance through Europe was at its height. The battle for air...